Good evening. I would like to extend my warm, warm welcome to you all. Thank you all for joining us tonight on our Fall 2021 People Make History Lecture hosted by the History Program at the Branford campus of Wilfrid Laurier University. The People Make History Biannual Lecture Series is generously supported by the Estate of Mary Stedman. It invites witnesses and participants of historic events to tell their stories. By sharing their memories, our speakers to date have brought history alive and made critical links between past and contemporary times. I am Dr. Christina Hahn, Associate Professor of Asian History and Coordinator of the History Program at Laurier Bramford. We have a very special speaker with us tonight, Jennifer Hostin, and our talk is titled Shattering Expectations, The Evolving Career of a Miss World. Now some housekeeping notes. We have enabled live transcript that can be turned on and off. If you wish to read the transcription while watching this talk, you can click the closed caption button at the bottom of your Zoom screen and choose show subtitles. The transcription is auto-generated, so it doesn't always do a perfect job. Next to the closed caption button, you will see a Q&A button where you can type in questions for our speakers. If we have time at the end, we'll try to take two to three questions from the audience. Before Jennifer joins us on stage or on screen, uh, we would like to invite, first invite president of our History Students Association, Alyssa Averink, for our land acknowledgement. Alyssa. Thank you, Dr. Hahn. Land acknowledgements are a small but necessary step towards reconciliation between Canada and Indigenous peoples. As students, faculty, and members of Wilfrid Laurier University, we hold an important responsibility in this process and acknowledge the land we study and work on was never ours to begin with. The Laurier Brantford campus is located on the Haldeman Tract, which is the traditional territory of the neutral Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples. It is fitting to take this time to reflect and honor this land and to understand that the governance of this land has shifted. On behalf of the Laurier Brantford History Program, I acknowledge the effects colonialism has had and seek to challenge and understand its legacies. At this time, I thank the neutral Anishinaabe Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples for allowing us the use of their land and hope events such as Laurier's People Make History are reminders of the importance of understanding history and the role of storytelling in education and reconciliation. Thank you, Alyssa. Now I would like to introduce our speaker, Jennifer Hostin. A native of Grenada, Jennifer Hostin trained with the BBC and was a broadcaster and airline hostess before winning the 1970 Miss World competition. She was a high commissioner for Grenada in the midst of its revolution and subsequently enjoyed a career as a Canadian diplomat and trade specialist. She also founded and ran a successful business in Grenada. Miss Hostin is a mother of two and she lives in Oakville, Ontario. Thank you, Jennifer, for joining us. I am thrilled to have this honor to interview you, and we have planned a wonderful program tonight. Jennifer is going to share with us uh, her life stories, some special photos, as well as her hit song released in 1971. The publisher of Jennifer's book, Sutherland House Books, also gave, us, uh, gave our audience a special discount code, which I'll share at the end of tonight's talk. Jennifer, I read your book, Miss World 1970, and watched the movie, Misbehavior, that featured the stories behind the Miss World competition in 1970. As much as I was interested in the stories behind that historic beauty contest, after reading your book, you, by the way, are a fantastic storyteller, I found your life before, before 1970, your upbringing, your education, and your personal goals to be really fascinating. Could you tell us what growing up in Grenada throughout the 1950s and 60s was like and how that might have shaped your worldview and what you wanted to accomplish in your life? Well, Christina, first of all, it's a delight to be here. Thank you for that kind invitation and also for your introduction um, to your question about what it was like to grow up in the 50s and 60s in one of the tiniest islands 
Uh, Grenada at the time, actually, as I recall, was a colony of, of the United Kingdom. And, um, and it was like a village, because I think the population in that period would have been about 50 or 60,000. So it was truly like a village and everyone knew each other. Um, my, I, I grew up with a sense of um, the values of, um, somebody's tried to call me, just a second, the value, can you hear me, Christina? I hear you, but your camera is off. His camera is gone, yes, um, just a second. Can you can you see me? Uh, not yet. Christina, are we back? Uh, your voice is here, but I don't see your your yeah. The, your screen is still off. I'm sorry. No worries, Jennifer. You can keep talking and. Um, we, we could hopefully try to figure out the screen. Looking to see what we need to do here. Someone phoned me, I think, and that... Um, yeah, that Jennifer's is on the phone to uh, connect with us. Yeah. Thank you for your patience, everyone. Um, Jennifer, maybe um, you could um, try to answer the questions and um, I could maybe... Uh, yes, we need to do some work to get that back. Right. Um, yeah, so the, the, um, the question you asked was about values. And uh, I recall that the values that um, were to do with um, community service. I, my father was a lawyer, so he spent a lot of time in the, on weekends visiting country areas and providing uh, free legal advice to people. And my mother was very active with the women's movement. She was um, a, a part of the Caribbean Women's Association. And I think she was actually the first woman to serve on the Co Public Service Commission in Grenada, um, for which she was honored with an MBE. So um, I had that kind of background. And um, as I say, Grenada was small, so it was a colonial power country at the time and the influences there. But I think growing up, um, I, my background, my racial background is Africa and, and Europe. So um, truly mixed and as are so many people in the Caribbean. So I grew up with a, you know, not, with race not being a primary issue. I think if, if anything at all, it was a uh, rather class conscious um, society. But um, apart from that, very supportive. Mm -hmm. So um, what were your dreams? Christina, about... I, wonder, I wonder if it would help if I turned off this and came back to, and checked back in. Do you think uh -huh. that might make a difference? Sure, we could, we could try doing that. Um, in the meantime, I could, play the music right now and uh, we can talk about your uh, music when you when you come back. Does it sound like Thank a plan? Thank you. Yes, oh. it does. Thank okay. you. So I will give uh, the audience a little background. In 1971, while uh, Jennifer was serving as uh, the Miss World, she decided to release an album and it became a hit album in Europe. And um, Nicole, can you screen share the album cover for us?
Okay, and that's what the album looked like. And you see uh, Jennifer uh, with her uh, crown and the scepter. Um, that was soon after she was chosen as uh, Miss World 1970. And why don't we listen to the music here while we wait? It's very groovy. Underneath the trees, holding everybody up for ransom. Hello, pipe in his hand, hard to understand. He was once a man so tall and handsome. Charlie was his name. All the children came just to hear the stories he narrated on the Spanish mail. There we go, and Jennifer is joining us. She's back. Can you unmute your mic, Jennifer? There we go, beautiful. And I do apologize for the um, technical problems we had before. Uh, someone tried to phone me and uh, that seemed to have, <laughs> of have done it all, started. yes. yes. All right, thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. I hope the audience enjoyed the music uh, while you were gone for, I think, about a minute or so. Um, so the question that I wanted to ask you was, did you have any goals or dreams growing up in Grenada um, as, as a young girl? Well, I think, um, I think I wanted to be a broadcaster. That was one of the first dreams that I had. And um, I was able to get into that. Um, I, I would have done that. I would have volunteered if I hadn't been given a job. I was that keen on doing it. Right. Okay. Yes. And you had your broadcasting career um, in Grenada, also in London, and later in Montreal, too. So what was your broadcasting career like in Grenada, London, and Montreal? Uh, were they different? And did you face any challenges as a woman of color in broadcasting? Well, I think, um, I think that I was relatively new into the field in Grenada and it was a creative process. I used to read children's stories and, and that sort of thing. Um, so I was a big fish in a small pond in Grenada. And in the B at the BBC, of course, it was training and the experience there of, of actually working in the field in, in a large environment. In Canada, it was the opposite of Grenada, because being a, a very small fish in a very large pond. And remember, I didn't have a lot of experience. So it was all quite different in all three places. Right. So did you think uh, you had particular challenges as a uh, woman of color working in broadcasting? Were there many people uh, who came from similar background as you um, or were you one of the very few people? No, I think uh, certainly in Grenada, it was, I didn't have to, um, to I didn't have that, that sort of pressure. Mm -hmm. um, you know, my background is, is very mixed, as I said, so that, um, and so is the island. So it, it was quite a normal sort of thing for me to be on, on the air. Um, in, in Canada, perhaps a little less so at that time, but I think perhaps the biggest challenge to me in Canada in broadcasting would have been my accent. Mm. Because I think when I first came to Canada, of course, my accent is more perhaps British mm -hmm. and Caribbean. And um, I didn't have a Canadian accent. I still don't really have a Canadian accent, but it's less important these days, I think, 
mm-hmm. as it would have been uh, 45 years ago. That's right. That's right. And after that, you chose to work as an air hostess. What was it like working in that industry? Because um, I see there's a lot of like romanticization about air hostesses from like popular media during that time. What was it like working um, as an air hostess and as a woman of color from Grenada? Well, first of all, in that period of time, it was a glamorous job. Mm-hmm. It was one of the few things that women could could be involved with, one of the few professions that would allow you to travel the world and meet lots of people, you know, so it, it was glamorous. And, and that, you know, somebody that loves adventure or liked adventure and uh, always, always have taken a chance, it was, it was something that I think um, was exciting to do. Mm -hmm. I enjoyed it. Right. Travel certainly is something that I enjoy too. Uh, Something people are missing a lot, especially right now during the pandemic. So you're working hard as a professional in your field. And how did you end up auditioning for Miss World 1970? Well, I really hadn't thought about Miss World at all. In fact, I knew very little about Miss World. I was working on a flight and uh, Miss Guyana came on the plane and in the course of the flight that someone asked me to take a picture with her and she started to uh, chat with me and asked me where I was from and what I did you know whether Grenada was sending anyone to the Miss World contest and I said not to my knowledge I don't even think they they know much about it mm-hmm. as as fate would have it mm-hmm. that year or the next year Grenada was sending um, a representative and I went over to Grenada uh, to visit my parents over Easter because I was living in Trinidad, which is the sister island, one of the sister islands and the headquarters of the airline. Mm-hmm. And, um, and I was approached by someone from the tourist office to enter Miss Grenada. And uh, honestly, it, it seemed, first of all, such a coincidence mm-hmm. having met Miss Guyana and all all of that at the same time. And then I said, well, if my sister would agree to help me, I might be um, encouraged because my sister knew far more about being, um, putting makeup on and things like that. I mean, I was a flight attendant, so I knew what it was, you know, that it was important to be groomed for the job and stuff like that, but I really wasn't into much of the glamour. Mm -hmm. My sister said she'd help. Mm-hmm. And it, it seemed as if everything worked together. So I entered the Miss Grenada contest, and I was fortunate enough to win that. Mm-hmm. And that then uh, allowed me the opportunity to go to Miss World. And I had really thought about winning a prize, the, winning the prize money, to be honest with you. And when I won Miss Grenada, I thought, well, that's great, you know. And then I ended up spending it all buying nice clothes to go off to the Miss World because I felt it was very important Mm -hmm. to be well presented. Mm -hmm. Um, My goal, of course, was to represent Grenada. Mm -hmm. Um, It was also the possibility of a different experience and a chance to win, to get some money, you know. (laughs) (laughs) So I had hope all of these practical reasons for doing it. Yeah. Right. right. So clearly entering the Miss World competition was not something that you have been preparing for. Um, So what were your thoughts entering the competition? And you said in the book that you felt very confident, although it wasn't something that uh, you were preparing for. Well, I didn't feel confident initially. Uh, but as things, as time went on, as I prepared myself, because I'm a great believer in preparation, as I prepared myself, uh, I made sure that I had a really nice gown. I had a, a, a good national costume, the required bathing suit and all of that. Um, I felt and I practiced, I practiced and practiced. And then I focused on, on what they might ask me 
in the interview mm -hmm. component because I felt that was where I might have a comparative advantage. And so I wasn't really confident going through it mm -hmm. until, uh, until the night of the contest. Because by the night of the contest, I had done everything that I could do to prepare myself. Mm -hmm. I had, um, I thought I had represented the island reasonably well in terms of interview questions that, you know, speaking with the media and meeting people and that sort of thing, because nobody knew where Grenada was. Mm -hmm. it was. Such a tiny place. And so at that, that by the night, I thought, you know what? Um, if I don't do well now, if I'm not confident now, I never will be. So preparation allowed me to feel that I had done enough that if I was going to do well, I would do well that night. And that's where that kind of confidence came from. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. Um, what made Miss World 1970 such a historic event? And how did you feel like, how was it like to be a, a, a main part of this historic uh, event? Well, Miss World Contest turned out to be very historic for a few reasons. Um, it was the launch or the women's liberation movement decided to, um, to use the contest to catapult themselves onto the world stage, which they did um, in a very uh, striking kind of way. They threw flower bombs on the stage and stopped the performance of Bob Hope, who was at the time the world's greatest entertainer, mm -hmm. um, stopped the show. And of course it made the news all over the world. Mm -hmm. There was also the issue of apartheid mm -hmm. because um, up until that time, there had only been one white representative from South Africa. And that year, 1970, because of pressure to do something, either to disallow South Africa from taking part um, or to, uh, to ban them in some way, instead, the organizers decided to have two representatives, mm -hmm. a white representative and a woman of color. Mm -hmm. And so, from the point of view of the 1970 contest, that was another feature, another news making issue. And, um, and of course, um, the media were a big part of, um, of the whole thing because the media amplified all of these issues. There was uh, also, in addition to the protest of the women's movement, uh, anarchists that um, started a, or set off a bomb outside yeah. of the BBC broadcasting booth. And so there was a lot of, um, of excitement. There was a lot of anticipation and um, it made the news all over the world. Certainly a lot was going on um, on that day. How did you feel about the whole judging process? Did you feel that sexism and racism influenced the judge's attitude towards certain contestants? Because in the book you mentioned, the judges certainly had their favorites. Well, I think less, far less the judges, but um, I think it's the media. The media were the ones that focused on issues of, of race um and and sexism and i think that um the media as they are today were very um you know influential in in, uh, in raising issues mm -hmm. and so i thought that the media and certainly when i won the media um it was shocking to me that the focus of uh, of all the reporting the day after was not the fact that i had won this representative from perhaps, perhaps the smallest country had won Miss World for the first time, but um, the Miss World was black. 
that was the headline miss yeah. world is black right. and um and and so it, it it actually i hadn't thought that, that that would be the focus and surprised me and it was it was and it was um it was sad and it was um what should we say it made me feel very badly i think Mm -hmm. that I then had to justify the fact that I had won. You know, right. I felt as if I, I, I that was my job to, to do, you know. And that's something that really shocked me when I was reading your book, that right after you celebrated your historic win, you were faced with post-contest controversy. Some people began accusing that the contest was rigged and, and that you had to deal with all these um, negative criticisms. How did you, how did you deal with them? Well, as I say, um, I think at first it it was shocking to me, and then I decided that um, that sort of pressure made me feel that I had to be the best Miss World, <laughs> you know. And I think this is what a lot of women of color feel. Mm -hmm. Uh, a lot of women feel, period, right. that whether they get an opportunity or an opportunity is presented to them, mm -hmm. it's up to them to, to really do well. Because if you don't, someone will, there, will always point a finger and say, well, you see, we gave that person an opportunity and they didn't rise to the occasion. Right. So here I felt, you know, well, this is a, an added pressure on me. And, um, and I think the other thing that, um, whether, uh, whether I realized it at the time or not, I certainly recognized it after, was the fact that the women's liberation movement were highlighting the fact that beauty contests objectified women, which of course they tended to do even more then. Um, but they did not consider the uh, intersectional issues of, of race and issues like that. Uh, and the, the fact that inclusion, mm -hmm. inclusion and representation were also issues of importance to people, especially women of color. Mm -hmm. I must admit that before reading your book, I had certain preconceived ideas about uh, beauty contests, uh, such as how they don't really serve women in general. But your story of what happened afterwards really changed my view. Could you tell us uh, what your duties were as uh, Miss World and how they contributed to your personal growth? Wow. Well, can you just imagine uh, coming from a small country, even though I had been abroad before and I had worked in the airline business. Um, so I knew I had met lots of people. I had traveled to some extent. All of a sudden, a week after winning Miss World, I am meeting Bob Hope, world's greatest entertainer, one of them at the time, mm -hmm. and a whole um, bunch of entertainers and traveling all around the world on stage singing with Bob Hope and <laughs> ad-libbing and, um, and, and generally being in front of entertaining um, United States troops in, in Korea, in South Korea, in, uh, in Alaska, in Vietnam, in uh, Germany, wherever we went, mm -hmm. you know, um, US troops and so on. So that was, you can imagine it's a, a baptism by fire. Right. So I had, and then, of course, traveling throughout the world. Right. And as a Miss World, you even produced a hit record, which um, the audience already got to listen to. Charlie was a good man. Like, how did that happen? And what was that whole experience uh, like? Because you're, you were not trained as a, as a musician or a singer uh, before you decided to record that song. No, you see what, what, what it means to have guts. <laughs> uh, well, the truth is that um, I found myself singing with Bob Hope, anything you can do, I can do better. I think it comes from um, um, Johnny Get Your Gun or something like that, one of the older movies. But um, 
I do like singing. Mm. And I, I, I think that I can turn a tune, but never considered myself a singer. Mm. So while I was touring in New Zealand, I was touring with um, a group that included a Maori group, Maori band. Uh, Maoris are the indigenous people of New Zealand. And um, just as an aside, I was not given many contracts for cosmetics and things like that mm -hmm. in 1970, as some, Miss some former Miss Worlds had. But instead, um, it was really interesting in my travels to see how I was able to connect with different cultural groups, mm -hmm. um, like the Maoris in New Zealand, who were so proud of the fact that a woman of color at One Miss World reached out to me and uh, asked me to wear Maori clothes and other indigenous designers around the world. Mm -hmm. You know, so that was, that was how my Miss World representation was different from some of the others. Coming back to the song, Charlie Was a Good Man, I was on a bus touring the country, New Zealand, and one of the, one of the musicians had decided to write a song for me to sing. And I didn't know he was working on it. But I was talking with Charlie, who was one of the Maori guys. And he gave me, he said, he made a joke. And I said, Charlie, you're a good man. <laughs> and, um, and Dave Luther, the guy who wrote the, the song, said, that's it. That's it. And I said, what are you talking about? And he said, that's going to be the name of the song. That's what it's all about. Charlie was a good man. And sh shortly after that, they gave me the opportunity to hear the song and to record it. And by some great uh, fluke, it became, <laughs> it, it was six, on, six weeks on the hit chart in New Zealand. <laughs> Wow, wow, amazing, amazing story. Um, I really love your song. I think you're a fantastic singer. Okay. Then, then your life took a very different turn. After serving your term as a Miss World, you got married to a Canadian and moved to Canada and lived on a farm. You even learned to milk cows. I have not milked a cow yet. How did you make that? How did you make that adjustment? Mm -hmm. Well, it's interesting because one of the things I discovered when I was Miss World was that uh, I had a lot of opportunity. I learned an awful lot about the entertainment industry. I learned enough to decide that I didn't want to be in the entertainment industry. I thought at the end of it, I wanted to live a very normal life. Mm -hmm. So actually, got, I got married shortly after that mm -hmm. and then found myself back in Canada because I had left Canada after, you know, first living in Montreal mm -hmm. and found myself on a farm. So, <laughs> but I, I think I am an adaptable person and I'm really down to earth, you know, really. So um, I enjoyed learning all these things. I enjoyed finding out about the farming community with, within which I lived. Mm -hmm. I got to know lots of people. I still am friends with many of them. Mm -hmm. Still keep in touch on Facebook and other, other, other means of um, communication. And um, I learned to milk a cow. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. Well, I, I should try. <laughs> Hopefully sooner than later. And then you returned to uh, work. What was it like as a former Miss World looking for a job and working in Canada? Did you miss your glam glamorous past? Because you had to do like job, go to job interviews and um, you did get rejected at least once, I, I remember in your book uh, or you turned down the offer too. So how was that experience like trying to find the job in Canada? Well, you know, this, this is one of the things I like about Canada. Some people don't understand when I say this, but um, 
it is that you really can be a big, a small fish in a big pond in Canada. Because I had been a big fish in a small pond in the United Kingdom, in England, mm -hmm. and in the Caribbean. And then I came to Canada and nobody knew that I had been a former Miss World. Well, they did, the newspapers at first did. And then very quickly, people who didn't read the newspapers, of course, wouldn't have known that. So that was rather nice. I could just be myself. And that was fine. That was absolutely fine. Um, I, I found that uh, what I did instinctively was to um, work in, in areas that I knew were things, places that I liked. For instance, I love meeting people and I had worked in the travel industry. So it made a lot of sense for me to look to that industry again. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I contacted Air Canada mm -hmm. and I was employed by Air Canada and, um, and, and worked with them for several years. Right. So you're working uh, for Air Canada, you had two children. And then suddenly an opportunity to take on a diplomatic career opened up for you. How did you make that leap? Uh, working for Air Canada and now pursuing a diplomatic career. Well, um, that, was, that was quite a different kind of leap, wasn't it? Right. I mean, I wasn't an experienced diplomat. I wasn't a career diplomat. Mm -hmm. So in... Um, in local parlance, they would say that I was a political appointee. Mm -hmm. There are two different types of, um, of diplomats. And um, because I'm a person that believes in preparation, first of all, I realized it was a big challenge. And, um, but it seemed a great opportunity to represent Grenada. And they seemed to really think that I could do it. I think that they felt that Throughout my travels as Miss World, I had done a good job of representing Grenada. And that's why they approached me. Right. I, I first went off and did a, a sort of crash course in diplomacy right. in Barbados in the Caribbean. And then, um, and then came back to Ottawa and discovered that I was the only head of mission, the only um, woman as a, an ambassador in Canada at the time. Um, I also then was a Canadian citizen. Mm -hmm. So a special concession had to be made for me. Uh, Pierre Trudeau was prime minister of Canada at the time mm -hmm. and he made a special concession for me. So he allowed me to take up the job because normally when you're a diplomat, you are representing a foreign country as a foreigner, right. um, but here I was having Canadian citizenship. Because I was a member of the Commonwealth, it was possible for Canada to make this concession for me. So I had diplomatic immunity during the day when I was on the job. And when I came home, I was a Canadian like everybody else. Wow. And so that, that's how we juggled that situation. Right. But it was a great experience. I traveled all through the Northwest Territories of Canada mm -hmm. and saw the most diverse country. I don't know how many people in Canada have had that opportunity. But it, for me, it was the high, one of the highlights of, of being an ambassador here in Canada. Mm -hmm. I had a little challenge, actually, at that point, because um, as head of mission, I was automatically invited to go up north. And when I expressed my desire to go, I then heard back from the protocol department that they didn't have facilities for women because no woman ambassador had previously gone to the Northwest Territories as a diplomat, uh, as part of this group. So um, I thought, you know, what, how sad that was, because I really was looking forward to it. Mm -hmm. So I went to a cocktail party and Pierre Trudeau was there, prime minister. And he came up to me and he said, Jennifer, I hear you're going up north. 
And I said, oh, I really was hoping to. But they tell me that they don't have facilities for women. So uh, it looks as if I'm not going to be going. And he looked at me and he said, uh, are you going to let that stand in your way? Mm -hmm. And I said to him, well, uh, what do you think? <laughs> so, <laughs> so next day, I got a call from the protocol department confirming that I was going up north. I see. So I was pretty sure mm -hmm. that Pierre Trudeau had stepped in and said, let, let it be up to her. But finally, I don't think that, that you, you should prevent her from going if she's willing to take the chance of going without the special facilities for women. Mm -hmm. And I'm glad that I went because not only did I, did I love the, the tour, mm -hmm. said it was a highlight, I met the most amazing communities of people, indigenous people, mm -hmm. who lived under such severe circumstances in some cases. Mm -hmm. And I felt, you know, and I always have felt this since, uh, in my other work in diplomacy and in my travels and my work in other countries, that that is a part of Canada mm -hmm. that, that all, of Can all Canadians need to know about. Mm -hmm. um, not only is it educational, but it's part of the developing world mm -hmm. because some of the challenges that still exist in Northern communities are those that are being faced by many people in developing countries. And um, I find this most amazing. After having this successful career as the high commissioner representing Grenada, you decided to go back to school to study political science. Why and what motivated you to make that decision? Well, as I say, I like to be prepared and I learned an awful lot. I was always, I should say, when, when I represented Grenada um, in any meeting or any international forum, um, I needed to know what position I should take and also what the issues were. I needed to know all sides of the issues. So I, I really did my homework. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and proved that I could, um, I could do the job. Um, but I think I always felt that there were things I needed to know more about and that um, education itself opens a whole host of opportunities. Mm -hmm. I use the Miss World as a stepping stone. I never saw it as, um, as something that would, that, that would define me. Mm -hmm. I, in fact, I made a very conscious effort not to be defined as just a former Miss World. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that goes to, to my thinking and belief about the importance of education, mm -hmm. because it can open so many doors and give you so many options, you know, in addition to being able to make more informed decisions, um, I think you know, today, especially with the opportunities that women have opened to them, we need to be as well prepared as possible to take advantage of them. And then you worked as a Canadian diplomat in the developing world. Um, how did that opportunity uh, rise and what kind of work were you involved in? It was very interesting, you know, one of my first jobs in the federal government, when I, um, when I joined the federal government, after I'd been High Commissioner for Grenada and after I'd been back and done a master's in uh, Carleton University in Ottawa, um, then I, um, I worked with the Department of Immigration and Citizenship at the time, which um, has now become called um, Canadian Heritage. I worked on the anti-racism campaign mm -hmm. and I discovered that, um, you know, there were so many areas of interest um, and I started working on women's issues as well. And that seemed to have progressed throughout my work in the government. Mm 
-hmm. When I went to work um, in the Central and Eastern Europe, for instance, I worked in women's programs there, but then I went on the South Asian division and worked on uh, programs in Pakistan and Bangladesh. Mm -hmm. And um, I found that, uh, of course, women's issues were big, very, very big, and very central to the whole issue of development everywhere. Mm -hmm. Because when women are educated and have opportunities, they um, somehow the whole community and the society gets lifted, mm -hmm. lifted up. And I found it wasn't enough when we worked on women's, women's participation in elections. In Pakistan in particular, I worked on a program that supported women in local politics. So we worked with the women, we worked with the communities to encourage the women to put their names forward mm -hmm. for um, elected office. Mm -hmm. And in so many cases, it, it was a good stepping stone for them to other things. But it was shocking to me that after women were able to, to get into politics, they were not enabled by the system in which they lived mm -hmm. to make the kind of changes and the difference that you would have expected women to pursue. Mm -hmm. I found that in Pakistan. I found that um, at one of the meetings, and I describe it in my book, one of the first meetings with these elected women that were now um, at the local government, that the men didn't want them to face the audience. The men thought that the women should turn the opposite way. And we had to, we had to, you know, demonstrate and say that that was not acceptable, you know. So um, that continued to be a challenge. And then I worked in Bangladesh. Mm -hmm. Later on, I was posted to Bangladesh and again found myself working on women's programs and, um, and legal issues again that um, women were at the very bottom of the pole and the even access to work and mobility mm -hmm. and these fundamental issues. Mm -hmm. And uh, in countries where women were the head of the country, we still found that it was the men who were making the decisions mm -hmm. and the women were just the figureheads. So it, it struck me that um, it's one thing to have inclusion, but it's another thing that the whole system needs to be supportive and informed as to why, mm -hmm. why these changes, not just, not just enough to make, um, to put people in positions. It, it's important to know why you're doing it and to have supportive mechanisms and so on. So it was very interesting to me. I've learned an awful lot, I would say, over the years about all these issues. And um, I guess it's, it had to start somewhere. But going back to school was a good decision. Mm -hmm. And as you know, I've done it a few times in my yes, life. Yes, <laughs> that wasn't the last time. <laughs> <laughs> and after you retired from your diplomatic career, you then decided to be an entrepreneur and create your own business. What did you do and why was this important to you? Well, while I was um, working in Bangladesh, I developed a bad back. And um, it struck me that um, coming back to Canada, at the end of my posting, I would be um, at a desk job, which I didn't think was the best for my back. And so I looked at my options and I was able to take early retirement from the federal government. I was sorry, because I'd lo love to have worked longer and done something more, a few more challenging um, assignments. 
but uh, it turned out that my health didn't um, allow me to do that. So I thought, what shall I do? It's way too early for me to retire. And I had always had this dream of owning a guest house in the Caribbean. So I went down to the Caribbean and I bought a piece of land with a small bungalow on one of the best beaches. And um, I decided that I would, you know, improve it and, and sort of use it, to start, a, start a guest house. I wasn't in Grenada more than three or four months. And that was 2004. When there was a major hurricane. I was in the house during the hurricane and then lost the roof and found myself in the car, you know, waiting it out. And, um, and at the end of it, the house was pretty much destroyed. So um, it was insured and I decided I would rebuild it. So I rebuilt it into a bigger version mm -hmm. of a guest house and then built a, a little bar and restaurant as well and owned it for quite a few years. So I ran it for the first five years in Grenada. Mm -hmm. And then later on, I came back to Canada and long distance man managed it mm -hmm. with coming and going and so on. But uh, finally I sold it and it was very successful actually. It was, we used to have guests from all over the world. And, um, and it was wonderful to reconnect with people that came to visit just because, just because, you know, they... Um... You lost your video. Yes. There we go. Are we back? Good. Yes. Um, yes. People would just come to visit because they knew that, you know, that somebody interesting was owning the guest house or that and they came from another country. And I was always able to find something to connect with them. Mm -hmm. And I found that fascinating. And that all had to do with travel. Mm -hmm. And of course, being open and, and willing to learn about other people too. Mm -hmm. It was a great experience. I sold it in 2018 mm -hmm. uh, to another hotelier. Um, who wanted to expand his hotel near to me. It was a good, it was good timing. And your story doesn't end there. Um, you didn't stop there and you went back to school again and got another master's degree in psychotherapy. Um, what inspired this decision? <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, um, that's right. I decided that I needed to do something in my older years. You notice I'm not saying old age. <laughs> so I, um, I decided that of all the things that really interested me at that point was psychotherapy. Mm -hmm. I think I was interested in it because of some of the experiences that I had had, personal experiences. Mm -hmm. um, I'd been through a few divorces. And I had had some life experiences. And um, I felt that I could contribute something of myself mm -hmm. uh, at that age. And the good thing about being a counselor mm -hmm. is that they're not looking to have, people are not looking for a young counselor, particularly. They're looking for someone who can connect with them mm -hmm. primarily. It's about connection, right. connect with them, mm -hmm. have empathy mm -hmm. and, uh, and someone they can relate to. Right. So I felt because of, of so many people saying to me, you're so easy to talk to or so easy to talk with. Mm -hmm. I felt that seemed almost a natural progression for me. Mm -hmm. And so I went back to school. I did my master's degree online and then I had the distinct um, what should we say privilege of working with native people in Canada mm -hmm. I loved it mm -hmm. I worked with um, I did my practicum with native child and family services 
downtown Toronto. And uh, some of the things I still remember doing with them. Um, when I took the children camping one summer, and then I, we stayed in a tepee, and um, we did the, the sweat lodge. And we did all the things that native people do. Mm-hmm. And I learned, I learned to, to do counseling mm-hmm. um, with native people mm-hmm. and took some of that knowledge with me into psychotherapy and, you know, counseling and talking with other people. I would use some of, some of those techniques as well. It was, it was a great experience. So I did that for 10 years. Mm-hmm. And I retired as a psychotherapist. I was licensed and everything until a year and a half ago. Mm-hmm. Um, wow. when, when the movie and the book and everything came out and, you know, I obviously had to prioritize and that wasn't. And especially when my clients started to ask me about my life, <laughs> I absolutely felt that it wasn't about me. Mm-hmm. Counseling is about your client. Mm -hmm. And that that was an obvious sign that my time had come to retire from that. Right. How did you feel when the movie Misbehavior came out in 2020? By the way, we have some uh, photos uh, that um, Nicole, can you share screen? Uh, while Nicole's uh, figuring out the images. Yes, how, how did you feel when the movie about uh, Miss World 1970 uh, came out? Yes, well, um, it wasn't a shock to me because uh, in 2010, I was invited by the BBC to go to London, England and uh, for an interview, um, a, a gal called Sally McGregor interviewed myself um, with along with the uh, women's libbers and Michael Aspel who had been the BBC interviewer at the time as well as a representative from the Miss World organization Mm -hmm. so the program was called the reunion Mm -hmm. and at that program uh, we all told our stories and a couple of days later Um, I flew back to Canada Mm -hmm. and uh, got back here and received a call from London, England. Some producers um, of Left Bank Pictures wanted to make a movie Mm -hmm. of that whole event and and the whole Miss World experience. Mm -hmm. And so um, I contracted with them as a consultant. Mm -hmm. And... um, it took 10 years wow. for them to develop it, to write the script, to do the research, to um, find the funding. And in 2020, the movie was released. But um, it was in the middle right there, right? Um, can you see the photo? Yes, yes. That was at the world premiere uh-huh. of the movie in London mm-hmm. in March 2020. Mm-hmm. With Gugu Magat Mabatha Raw mm-hmm. with the yellow dress, Gugu right. played me in yeah. the movie. And to the right of me, I'm in the middle, to the right of me is Pearl Jansen, who was Miss Africa South. She was the woman of color, mm-hmm. the colored woman who, um, like, you know, like she, she came second. I came first, she came second. And um, it was wonderful to see her again because I had not seen Pearl since the night of the contest. Right. And that was one of the other things about the movie Misbehavior. The, the premiere was wonderful. Mm-hmm. But um, reconnecting yes. with Pearl. And this was Abby, the little girl who played the part of Abby, um, the daughter of Sally Alexander in the movie. So if, if you've seen the movie at all, you recognize Abby. She's just lovely, lovely child. And this is with my, um, with my family, my son and my daughter flanking me and my son's wife, Rebecca, at the very end. They came with me 
or they met me, uh, Sophia traveled with me and Bo and Rebecca joined us in London for the world premiere. Mm -hmm. It was wonderful to have them there. Right. And we have one more photo or two. That is with uh, the Grenada delegation. Mm -hmm. Grenada decided to be part sponsor of the world premiere mm -hmm. um, because they were so proud, not only of my win, but of the movie Misbehavior, which um, gave them, you know, when, mentioned the country several times and so on. And of course, brought back a story that many people have told for years and years. Mm -hmm. So that's the Grenada delegation with me at the world premiere. And I believe we have one more photo. Oh, no. Okay. Um, thank you so much for that. Um, we are almost out of time. So I will keep my one more question. I'll, I'll, I'll give you yes. one last question. How did you keep going? Like, What fuels and inspires you? Do you consciously try to improve yourself or do you just kind of take a leap of faith and make the most of opportunities life presents to you? Because you've done so many different things in your life. This, is, this goes back to my own belief that you don't owe it to anyone to define you. You define yourself. It turns out that women have many, many different gifts. And I think the key is to find out what, you know, find a purpose. I've always looked for a purpose in my life, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and I think many of the things that I ended up doing were professions or opportunities that led to something in which I could be useful. Mm -hmm. And so I think that that's very important for me. Um, defining myself, not allowing any one failure or any one uh, success define us. Mm -hmm. We can continually uh, redefine ourselves. And I think that's what I've done with purpose, hopefully, each time. Thank you so much, Jennifer, for sharing your inspiring life stories with us tonight. Um, I would like to thank you all for joining our fall 2021 People Make History Lecture with Jennifer Hostin. Publisher of Jennifer's book, uh, Sutherland House Books, has provided a discount coupon code for our attendees tonight. And the coupon code is Miss World 25, all uppercase without space. And a thank you email will be sent to, to all attendees and you will find the coupon code there as well. A recording of tonight's lecture will be posted later on our People Make History webpage if you wish to watch it again or share it with anyone who couldn't join us tonight. And big thanks to Jennifer once again for shattering all expectations and inspiring us to live big and live free. And a special thanks to Nicole Morgan, our program assistant, for organizing this lecture. And thank you everyone for attending this talk tonight. Uh, Christina, the... Christina, yes. thank you so much. I have thoroughly enjoyed speaking with you. And I do thank your team as well for all the, the um, for the technology and all that they've done. And it's really been a delight and uh, to be part of this special series at Wilfrid Laurier University has made me very interested as well in the work uh, of, of Wilfrid Laurier University. I am very um, interested to see that it's a holistic approach that um, you promote. And, um, and, and I encourage the students to take advantage of you know, practicum of opportunities um, as you study because I found that you learn so much and, and mentorships and so on really do help. So thank you for this opportunity and, um, and thank you for allowing me to find out more about your programs as well. Thank you, thank you, Jennifer. I wish all of you a wonderful evening and see you all at our winter lecture. So goodbye, everyone. Goodbye. <laughs> I'll see you again.